the world looks to California to answer the hard questions for redemption, to introduce the unfamiliar, to be resilient. Because California bounces back, holds us accountable, values who we are, remains vigilant, defies those in our way, and stands for community. Here on the West Coast, we're at the center of it all. Los Angeles Times, the state of what's next. Good evening. I'm Steve Padilla. I'm editor of the LA Times front page feature, Column One. I've been with the Times for 33 years, and I'm one of several staffers who helped conceive and edit and produce our project on the Chicano Moratorium. I'm a native Angelino, and I well remember the summer of 1970. I was just a boy, but I remember. And uh, I remember how my parents, who grew up in East LA, talked about the death of Ruben Salazar 
and how they talked about how it was such a loss for the Mexican-American community. And it happened at the Chicano Moratorium. And what was that, the moratorium? Well, on August 29th, 1970, at least 20,000 demonstrators marched through the streets of East Los Angeles, and they were protesting the Vietnam War, specifically the, dis the disproportionate number of Mexican-Americans who were being killed while serving overseas. Then the event known as the National Chicano Moratorium Against the Vietnam War took place. It started out peacefully, but that afternoon, there was an altercation, a disturbance, and that set off skirmishes between demonstrators and the law enforcement, principally sheriff's deputies. By day's end, two people would be mortally wounded, and trailblazing journalist Salazar, Ruben Salazar, was dead. In the Mexican-American community, his, his death, uh, he would be likened, rather, as a, as a martyr, and his death would be likened to the assassinations of the Kennedy brothers or uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Tonight, we're gonna to have a conversation about Salazar, his legacy, and the importance of that day. And I'm gonna be joined by two of my fine LA Times colleagues, Daniel Hernandez and Carolina Miranda, and as a special treat with uh, uh, one of our alumni, uh, someone from our alumni association, former LA Times journalist Robert Lopez will be with us too. We're gonna to be talking about the moratorium and the fight for civil rights. They're among a big team of writers, editors, photographers, videographers, designers, who put together the series about the moratorium it uh, debuted this uh, last Sunday on LATimes.com and, uh, and in print. And there's still some more stories to come that you'll see uh, the rest of this week. We aim to capture the significance and the lasting impact of that day. And our team ran into many surprises. Uh, one we'll tell you a little bit about later is one reporter discovered a familial connection to one of the deaths, incredibly, from that day. And another one was a, a surprising piece about what you might call the Chicana rights movement, as opposed to the Chicano rights movement. Uh, it's a piece about the women who were in the uh, activist group uh, Brown Berets, and they felt like they weren't quite getting the respect they deserved, and they formed their own group called Las Adelitas de Atzlan. Now, in many ways, um, the events of August 29th, 1970, hobbled the Chicano rights movement. Uh, it was in many ways a setback. And yet, there were seeds planted that blossomed years later, and some of the people who marched down Whittier Boulevard that day later became leaders in business, uh, in politics, education, and the arts. It was a catalytic moment, a catalytic moment for Los Angeles. Now, I have plenty of questions for our panelists, but I'm sure you will have some too, and you can send them to us through the Times Facebook page and on Twitter. They'll get the questions over to me. I'll introduce our guests in just a moment, but first, First, I want you to hear from some people who were there, some people who were there that hot summer day 50 years ago this week. The Chicano moratorium was unforgettable. We were very vocal, we were angry, and we demanded justice. What I saw was unbelievable. It just, uh, it was like a powder keg that went off. And basically it was uh, the largest violence against Mexican Americans in Los Angeles since the Mexican American War. And then they took away our voice. Ruben Salazar. August 29th, 1970, East Los Angeles, there's a National Chicano Moratorium, and it happened. And it was glorious. It was uh, like both a fiesta and a political movement walking down the heart of East L.A. And I would say just about every barrio, just about every small town, farm town, was represented there. We had heard there's gonna be a riot. And I said, well, we didn't think the people would go for it. And we felt the community wouldn't, and it didn't. It was only, the only way they got it going is they broke up the crowd, beat up on women and children, went into the streets uh, shooting tear gas and with shotguns that people fought back. 
My mother expressed it 30 years later at a Sunday sit-down dinner after church, and we were talking it at the table, my dad and a cousin or brother. And my mother said, those little girls, the, the uh, folklorical group that was dancing, they were so pretty, dressed so nice, they danced so well. The sheriff had no business coming into that park. Where are we now? We're still not at parity, but it has changed. And so we need to be moving forward. I think the, the true legacy of the Chicano Moratorium was that it inspired a generation of Chicano activists to go forth in the world and uh, become our community's doctors and lawyers and educators and filmmakers and, and writers uh, and social activists <clears throat> and healthcare professionals. Uh, it was a whole generation that was inspired uh, because we wanted to make our community better. It actually saved lives because people were thinking about social change, people were thinking about movement. Uh, as a result of the Chicago moratoriums, there was less drugs in the community, less gang violence in the community, because people were changing the directives uh, toward the system, understanding that we needed social change to help the community. And again, you probably would find that many people that day also decided to go to law school, go for their PhDs, decided to go out and paint for their whole lives and create music. And so the visceral feeling of being tear gassed and being chased and actually being shot at, um, that's something to remember. Uh, but at the same time, uh, when all the smoke cleared away, um, we still had a vibrant community and, uh, and actually a stronger community. Many people actually visibly, viscerally, and emotionally made commitments to their families and to their friends and to their community to make sure something like what had happened on the 29th would never take place again. I don't see myself as a poet, but I feel that that's, you know, how we have to deal better with each other. So you gotta honor the past and be true to the present and, and uh, have faith and hope for the future. The producer of that video was uh, Steve Saldivar, by the way. And if you uh, want to watch it again, you can find it at latimes.com in our package on the Chicano Moratorium. So this uh, past Sunday, our lead story uh, in the paper was by Daniel Hernandez. And it was about what we in the planning group called the Moratorium Generation and how that group was forever changed by the events of that day. Uh, Daniel writes about culture for the times, and we're going to welcome him right now. Daniel, you there? Hey, Steve. There he is. Good evening, sir. Hello. So, hey, so, you know, um, in the past, there's always been tons of uh, anniversary stories written about the death of Salazar and all that and the moratorium. And they've tended to focus just on Ruben Salazar with the moratorium really kind of almost as an afterthought. And this was a very different approach where the moratorium was the, 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 the real focus of it. And this particular generation, could you tell us about how that came about and, and uh, why you wanted to tell that story? Well, yeah, just as you say, I think that a lot of the focus over the years has been on um, Ruben, and rightfully so. Um, but I sort of had the sensation that at 50 years, and many of the people in this generation still being around with us, that we should kind of revisit and see how they're feeling about the things that happened and about the moratorium and about the trajectory of their lives. And so I set out just to interview people, and, you know, it would often one interview would often just lead to someone else. So this person was there, then halfway through, someone in our planning group that you mentioned shared a photo. Steve Saldivar actually shared a photo of Gloria Molina being at the moratorium, which seemed like a historical footnote that mm -hmm. um, was interesting to, to pull out. And so th there was a lot of interesting little threads that came out. And this still being the newspaper business, we had to compress a lot of stuff in there. And so, as you know, you were editing the piece. I know, I cut your story. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> No, so, you didn't cut it. You made it much better. But also, we we, we gave it a loving squeeze. 
Uh, I wonder if you might tell people a little more about one of the gentlemen in the video, the guy in the lime green, in the light green uh, uh, Guayabera shirt. That's uh, that was uh, Rosa Dia Munoz, right? Right. And he's very interesting. In why don't you tell about his trajectory from high school to protesting for Chicano rights? It's quite this tale. Yeah, I think um, people sometimes in LA tend to forget that there is a, a rich Mexican American history that goes back now centuries, and it's been called different things over different points in time, but essentially uh, Rosalio and a lot of people from that group in that period and that era were sort of very standard established middle class Mexican Americans who, according to the federal government, were still classified as white, essentially, no matter how Mesoamerican they were in feature. Um, uh, and so- Tell them what he was called in high school. I was getting to that. So he was known as Ross at Franklin High and he ran for and won the student body presidency at Franklin High there in Highland Park. Um, another interesting footnote is that he was old high school friends and UCLA friends with Doug Smith, a long-term reporter um, with us at the LA Times, one of the veterans. And so, um, you know, after that, Rosalio went to UCLA, also ran for student body president there and won, core coordinating with um, Frances Noriega. They figured that increased visibility of brown uh, guys like them, brown activist figures like them, um, would be overall beneficial to this idea that Mexican Americans and Chicanos wanted some kind of social, uh, political, and economic parity in American society. And so everything was part of strategy for Rosalio, and he sort of um, really kept his heart in the movement over the years. So I thought it was really important to revisit and, and to visit with him, with Steve, um, and, and looking at, um, you know, how intimately he maintains a relationship to those memories and to uh, the ephemera of that era. And he's not the only one who holds on to that day or was affected, maybe I should say, deeply. Uh, I thought one of the more moving things in your story was you told told the story of a woman named uh, Consuelo Flores uh, and her shoes. I'll, I'll let you say the rest. Yeah, I mean, as I said, there would, you would just meet, sort of a call would lead to another call, and Consuelo was just such a moving story. And I know actually she's with us tonight, and she's at the event, so I wanted to say oh, really? hello and send my gratitude to her again for sharing her story with us. It was so vivid, Steve, in her mind still. During our interview, um, I was nearly moved to tears, and I'm not the teary-eyed type in most circumstances, but... What I can got from speaking to Consuelo was that this was a memory that 50 years later happened only in the blink of an eye. And so for many people who've also been writing since and telling us about how vividly they remembered that particular day, August 29th, I think is very moving. So Consuelo's out there. She's nine years old. An older brother of hers um, had returned from uh, serving, had been harassed and spat on, she tells me, um, for wearing his uniform. And they knew in the community, and even as a child, that she was them, that this was an important event and the community was going to come together and stand up together. So as the sheriff's deputies come in and in, in clearing Laguna Park, shooting tear gas, batoning anyone that they see, there were some elements, of course, of retaliation from people in the crowd. But mostly the crowd, as many people know, was largely um, children, families, old people, uh, women, peaceful uh, gatherers. And so she starts running with an older sibling of hers, goes barefoot on the hot concrete. But just to back up, tell them why. She wore those red shoes because they were very special to her. And she yes. wanted to, to wear those for this important event. And the march went literally by their house, if I recall correctly. And they joined her and some siblings. And so that's why she wore those special red shoes. And then I'll let you pick it up again. Then what happened? Exactly. Thank you. So yeah, she um, she can't quite put them back on. She would take them off to um, rest in the grass. It was a hot day. And so as they're running and escaping, she loses these shoes, her prize shoes. And a couple days later, as they're out there reviewing the aftermath, walking around with their family, this was a chaotic night in East LA. People, didn't know, people were scattered. They didn't know where to go, where to turn. A lot of strangers were taken into homes. A lot of people had come from out of state. They were kind of running around unfamiliar with L.A. Families were separated. She said, uh, Consuelo tells me that she had been separated from another sibling of hers who didn't show up much later. A couple days later, she's out with her family reviewing the damage that had occurred on Whittier Boulevard, and she spots these shoes. 
and they're discarded and dirty and, and um, no longer usable. And for her, that becomes an epiphanous metaphor for her many years later of why she sort of always wanted to wear red shoes and kind of recapture those that she had lost. So it's an incredibly moving story that just in the few column inches that we were able to tell it, I, I hope was able to convey the rawness of those memories for many people. And, and that's why uh, viewers were able to see a little earlier that image of her with all those red shoes, right? And then there was uh, some tennis shoes with the words mom on, with the word mom on them. That was uh, one of her kids made that, right? Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. And so uh, one of the things, you know, there they are, absolutely. And so she found that that was just, a, you know, kind of a loss of innocence, which was a comment that Gloria Molina made as well to you. Um, she was really, it didn't turn her into an activist. Uh, she was kind of already down that road, um, yeah. but she was there that day. And, she, and if I recall correctly, you said she actually had some reservations about participating in the moratorium. Gloria yes, Molina. Found that, yes, very interesting. Gloria Molina, of course, a titan figure in uh, California politics, trailblazer, first Latina to the County Board of Supervisors to the State Assembly. She had had a bad experience traveling to Mexico with her family and was treated poorly by Mexican immigration authorities. Um, Gloria Molina, I believe, is at least half um, second generation. Um, and so she's sort of like a very, to me, she cut the figure of the kind of um, fully assimilated and kind of integrated, fully Americanized uh, brown Latino person in Los Angeles. So she almost didn't want to go to the moratorium that day because she didn't want to march potentially behind any flags of Mexico. And so that to me was a very interesting detail um, that I think reflected that people of all kinds of political persuasions were there, not just sort of radical would be um, uh, socialists or reconquistadores uh, uh, for the Chicano movement, but also many kind of moderate and sort of middle of the road Democrats, the kind that um, really still wield so much power in Los Angeles today. And in, so, in fact, I think you said many of the organizers were really from the, what we call the Mexican American middle class uh, at that point. Definitely, um, you know, a lot of them came from um, the universities. They were law students um, or already practicing lawyers. Oscar Seta Acosta, I've learned in subsequent days that there was a Guatemalan American activist known as Gonzalo Javier, who um, had also come from a college kind of background organizing experience. So I think it's a reminder again, that we can't lose sense of the history that sort of we're not just immigrants and we're a different kind of native, I guess, that is part of this quilt of California history. And I think should have, um, you know, the rightful role in, in the way that we understand that history. Yeah, uh, let's let's go back for a second and just talk about what touched off all the chaos. And there's different accounts of what happened, and I don't know if there's any really clear narrative. Um, there are different interpretations. You could you talk people through that? Um, I'm talking yeah, about the incident at the liquor store, or supposed incident at the liquor store. Right. So Green Mill Liquor Store, about a block away, during the rally at Laguna Park. Um, there was just a lot of people in there. From uh, my understanding of both talking to historians, witnesses, and even some of the people on our staff, Lewis Hagen did an incredible story, Robert Lopez's story as well, delves really into the fine details there. But basically there was a ruckus, the sheriffs were called, there was fear that people would be shoplifting or had, there were too many people in the store, he locks the doors and that just intensifies the situation. Next thing you know, these deputies arrive, excuse me, someone throws a bottle, Something breaks, glass breaks, boom, the chaos begins. Now, there are other um, accounts that say some of the kind of tension had started a bit earlier um, during the march. Um, and there are um, you know, significant accounts from the sheriff's department. They also documented in a 2011 inquest that um, you know, something like 75 deputies were injured. People definitely sort of fought back and uh, conveyed their anger, at least on the kind of minority element um, in this large peaceful group that were responding to the way that they were being treated. And it had been happening for a long time before. Uh, two young Mexican Americans had been uh, killed in sheriff's custody, um, I believe it was in 68 or 69. And some of this repressive tactics by law enforcement could definitely continued after for the following year, many demonstrations that followed. 
Right. Well, one of the things you mentioned was the story by Louisa Hagen, which is really a chronicle of that day, the things that went on beyond the death of Ruben Salazar. And I think one thing that uh, I think both you and I found very illuminating in that piece was Lewis pointed out that although this was a peace march, I mean, that was the goal of this, you know, against the war, when the when the sheriff's deputies started trying to clear the park and got, you know, very aggressive, all these, uh, these simmering, you know, angers came to the forefront about, uh, you know, police policing, about education, about all sorts of inequities and prejudice and discrimination against the Mexican-American community. And that all came bubbling up, didn't it? I would say that that's probably the most accurate way, I think, to assess why it was so violent and why it was consequently so traumatic for so many people. There was a lot of anger that the Sheriff's Department and the LAPD and LA City at large had just been treating Mexican-American people unfairly and violently and abusively. And this is also also reflected, of course, among the African-American community in the time. The Watts riots had just happened a few years earlier. And so mm -hmm. I think that um, the sense of anger and the combustion of that anger really occurred in this organic way, unfortunately, that day. And as a result, three people died, Lynn Ward, uh, Diaz, and uh, Salazar. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the few journalists who was really writing about that anger was uh, Ruben Salazar. And uh, he died that day because he was uh, struck by a, a tear gas, um, uh, essentially a missile, uh, that was fired by a sheriff's deputy into the Silver Dollar uh, Bar and Cafe. He was uh, hit in the head and killed instantly at the time. He, uh, he had been a reporter for the Los Angeles Times, both in LA and overseas. Uh, he was at that point a columnist for the paper, uh, but also a uh, news director for the Spanish language television station KMEX. And so now we're going to turn to uh, to Salazar as well. We're going to talk a little more about his life, not just his death. And we're going to turn to uh, Robert Lopez, a uh, member of the LA Times Alumni Association. Uh, Robert, yeah, you there? Welcome. I'm here. Excellent, excellent. Hi, so Steve. before we talk about his death, and that was something you've you've really studied for for years, what went on, and I want to hear you explain that. Try to could you please um, tell our re listeners just why was he significant? What was it about Salazar? that made him an important figure uh, you know, for the, the Mexican-American community in Los Angeles and beyond, actually. Well, Salazar was a uh, trailblazing journalist who opened the door for a whole generation of Latino journalists and inspired them to uh, pursue journalism careers. And that includes you, me, Daniel, Carolina, all of us on this um, panel tonight. He um, was really a very uh, complicated figure. He's been portrayed as sort of this mythical symbol uh, after he died for the Chicano movement and uh, the people he covered. But in reality, Salazar was very complicated. I um, described him as a um, skilled code shifter. And by that, I meant he was a man who could navigate between Latino and white worlds. Um, he was equally comfortable reporting in Spanish in a Mexican-American neighborhood one day and um, next day wearing a suit and tie and interviewing a U.S. senator. And he uh, was the type of... Uh, man who really fit in well in the predominantly white male newsrooms of the 1950s and 60s. Um, he started his career in 1955 at his hometown newspaper, the El Paso Herald Times, where he was um, very investigative, uh, did some very hard edge reporting. He pretended to be drunk, was arrested, and this allowed him to expose uh, wrongdoing in a city jail that was notorious for abuses. He bought heroin on the border uh, from a drug dealer named La Nacha in Juarez, Mexico, and basically talked about how easy it was to do that. Uh, a buddy of his uh, recruited him to work at the Santa Rosa Press Democrat in uh, 1957. Salazar spent a couple of years in Northern California and came to the Los Angeles Times in 1959. And um, he wasn't the first Mexican-American in the newsroom there at the LA Times. Uh, many people think he was, but he wasn't. But he was certainly uh, the one who rose to the most prominence. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, he became a foreign correspondent. And for those people who don't know, that's one of the most prestigious assignments uh, in a newsroom anywhere. Uh, and he came back to, uh, from over, being overseas after about four years in um, the Dominican Republic, Vietnam, and Mexico City, where you see him here. He was the bureau chief uh, for the LA Times there. 
It came back at a time when the uh, Mexican-American community had transformed dramatically. Uh, the civil rights movement had swept across the barrios of the Southwest. Activists had begun calling themselves Chicanos. And uh, Salazar stayed at the LA Times for about a year, and uh, he left. Uh, he had an opportunity to become news director, as you mentioned earlier, at KMEX TV, a small Spanish language station. Um, and it was at that period that he agreed to write this weekly column that appeared every Friday. And it's these columns that he's probably best known for. Um, over a seven month period in the last year of his life, he wrote um, every week. And uh, his columns really explain the hopes, uh, the frustrations, and the aspirations of the uh, Mexican American community at the time. And this was a community that had been largely ignored by the mainstream media, including the LA Times. And so Salazar gave this community a voice, a voice that it didn't really have. But it was at KMEX where he really extended himself. Salazar has never really gotten the credit for being the visionary journalist that he was. He realized uh, that this opportunity at KMEX was a chance to reach a growing Spanish language market. And when he left, he talked about how his colleagues at the Times were surprised. And some of them even said, KM what? But in reality, it was a great move. Not only was he the boss and got to direct news coverage, but this was a station that reached nearly 300,000 viewers every weeknight with this hour long newscast. And the largest- Wasn't it actually the largest viewers, local newscast, I think at the time? It was actually probably the third behind NBC and ABC. Okay, that was our pretty big. All right. column in March. Yeah, it was very big. And the largest chunk of these people were not old Spanish speaking immigrants, but they were people between the ages, men and women between the ages of 18 and uh, 49 years old. So Salazar saw this as an ability to influence and reach this population. And that's what really landed him in hot water with the police and law enforcement. His uh, small news crew was very aggressive in its coverage of escalating tensions at the time between Chicano activists and the Los Angeles Police Department and Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. And um, in March of 1970, for instance, the police chief at the time was a guy named Ed Davis. He was furious with Salazar. He summoned Salazar to his office at the LAPD headquarters downtown, just a few blocks from the LA Times where it was located at that point. And I talked to the man who uh, went with Salazar to the meeting, Joe Rank. Joe was uh, Salazar's boss. And Joe described the meeting uh, in very sort of stark terms. Uh, Davis was decked out in his dress blue uniform, flanked by two aides, and he tried to intimidate Salazar. He had accused Salazar of reporting a lie and basically fabricating a statement that Davis claimed he didn't say. And according to Joe, Salazar looked at Davis and said, I have it on tape. It's accurate. You want me to apologize? I'm not. And as you might imagine, that didn't go off very well. And in fact- well, Ed, Ed Davis was furious that, with a lot of people. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, he was furious with a lot of people. And I can tell you that 25 years after the fact, when I talked to him, he was still upset with Ruben Salazar. And the first thing is he laid into him and criticized him. I mean, it was like, it was just like 1970 all over again. I mean, the man was very angry, but what I found out in my reporting is the LAPD had uh, created a dossier on Salazar for Davis, an intelligence file. And it had the usual stuff these types of files have, you know, bio on the guy, uh, photocopies of some of his LA Times articles, and uh, transcripts of some KMEX news uh, broadcasts. But it also had something that was really disturbing to me. And that was this short memo uh, in which police uh, talked about an LA Times employee who they described as a reliable, confidential informant who was passing information about Salazar to the LAPD. So in effect, you had somebody at the news organization who was basically providing information to the cops about a colleague. And obviously, as you know, and everyone on this panel knows, that is a, a breach of ethics of the highest sort. That was a breach back then. That's a breach now. And that was just outrageous. And I tried over the years, so I have my suspicions, but I could never confirm the name of that individual, but I do know that Salazar didn't trust some of his colleagues in the newsroom. Well, um, in your story where you talk about your um, years-long effort to find out what happened, 
uh, you talk about how just days before his death, he expressed some fears. Uh, he and did, and it really was interesting. Me was it was a conversation he had with a gentleman who was my journalistic mentor, <laughs> and uh, so and I've heard him describe that conversation as well. But uh, if you could share, fill us in, I think it was uh, they were at the restaurant in Olvera Street, and they're talking. Yeah, they were at La Luz del Dia restaurant, which is still there on Olvera Street. Um, and uh, it was Charlie Erickson, uh, a pioneering journalist who, as you say, uh, launched the career of careers of many Latino journalists. Um, and it was a man named Phil Montes, who was then the um, director of the U.S. Office of Civil Rights, the L.A. office, and a Catholic priest, Henry Casso. They were close friends of Salazar. And I spoke to all three men about this, and they all described basically the same thing. Ruben was shaken. He was frightened, and he was worried the police were following him. They said he was constantly looking over his shoulder, and he was fearful that police were going to do something to discredit him and his reporting. And at the same time, I found out from Guillermo Restrepo, who was Salazar's reporter at KMEX, they were taking part in a big investigation of allegations against police and sheriff's deputies. And these allegations were serious. They had been told that deputies and, sheriff and uh, LAPD officers had allegedly beaten suspects in some cases, and in other cases had planted evidence on suspects to make false arrests. But they were tipped off. Police found out what they were doing. And as Restrepo said, we were in hot water. So it's amid this type of environment that Salazar meets his three friends three days before the march. The night before, he's at KMEX, and I talked to another boss of his, uh, Danny Villanueva, former LA Rams uh, kicker. Um, okay. Danny, we called Salazar as being sort of somber and despondent. He cleaned up his messy desk. He got his hate mail, which was his badge of honor, as Danny described it, that he liked to have displayed because he knew he was doing his job if people were getting mad. He put that away. He walks out, Danny says, see you later. And he says, Salazar turned around and says, yeah, if I make it back. And the next day, he's killed. And Tell so- Tell us what transpired at the Silver Dollar uh, uh, Bar and Cafe, which is on uh, Whittier Boulevard, uh, actually a, a good distance from Laguna Park, which has since been renamed, by the way, uh, Salazar, Ruben Salazar Park. Um, but it's uh, I don't know, maybe a mile or so, at least to the, to the east. Um, so the yeah, it's a mile east, day, you say. Yeah, on that day, we should just recap this for, for everyone here. Uh, the cops tried to clear uh, Laguna Park. People are running all sorts of directions. Fires were set. Uh, uh, police cars were set on fire, overturned. People are beaten. People are injured. Um, we know that at least 75 uh, officers hurt, but untold numbers of, of uh, people injured, you know. Um, and so that it was concentrated largely there around uh, the park, which was kind of near the corner of Indiana and Wish Wilshire Bull of uh, and Whittier Boulevard, farther to the east is the Silver Dollar, and Salazar goes in there. It's been a busy day. He's been out there since like eight in the morning. He goes in there to get a beer to take a little break after doing all that reporting. And then what happens? It's about five p.m. I think this time. Yeah, it's about five p.m. As you said, he and Restrepo had worked their way east. Their cameraman had gone back to the station. He had run out of film. He had been hit by a rock and partially burned by a tear gas canister. So it's like 93 degrees that day. They go in to use the restroom, and then they decide to grab a, a quick beer. They sit down. They order their drinks. And unknown to them, sheriff's deputies swoop down at the tavern. They say they are responding to reports of two armed men who are inside the tavern. Those reports later turned out to be false, not true. And what happened next has been a source of controversy, you know, for 50 years. Deputies say they shouted warnings for the people inside to get out. But we've got photographs in black and white that show armed deputies apparently forcing people to go back in, including a man who's got his arms raised. Everybody inside the bar testified later that they heard no such warnings. One deputy fires two projectiles including, as you described earlier, a torpedo-shaped missile that's 10 inches long. This is actually a torpedo with fins, and it was designed to be used in barricade situations and ripped through plywood. There's a curtain doorway at the Silver Dollar. 
That missile flies through and strikes Salazar in the head as he's sitting next to Restrepo. And as Restrepo told me, they had barely gotten their beer and didn't even get a chance to enjoy it. And boom, the smoke starts filling the place. He gets down on his hands and knees. He crawls out. Another deputy comes, not knowing that there had been two shots already fired of tear gas. He logs in two more tear gas canisters into the place. Salazar's body lies there for several hours. Restrepo says he tried to tell sheriff's deputies, my boss is in there. We need to go get him. They said, get the hell out of here. And so his body's not discovered until hours later that evening. And by that time, KMEX uh, editors and news directors are trying to call in vain, trying to find out what happened. Restrepo's like, he didn't come out. I know he's in there. And when they finally go in that evening, there's a body in the smoky uh, little tavern, and it's Ruben Salazar. He had been struck in the head, and he was 42 years old. And that killing, to this day, remains a source of suspicion and speculation. Absolutely. There were uh, two other people injured that day. They died days later. One was a guy named uh, um, Angel or Angel Diaz. He was 35, and he actually... Um, he tried to run down some sheriff's deputies. He, his car was, he took his car and he was barreling down a, a, a Whittier Boulevard and tried to run over deputies. Uh, they fired at him. Uh, one, per, one, one deputy shot him in the neck and he crashed into a telephone pole. He died a few days later. The, the other death, and this is the, 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 one of the stranger things that came up in our reporting, and this was from Louis A. Hagen. Uh, Robert, I don't know if you noticed this in, in the coverage. So the other person who died from injuries that day was Lynn Ward. He was 15 years old. He was a member right. of the Brown Berets. He was from El, El, El Monte. And he was what they called a medic. In other words, he was tasked with carrying uh, medical supplies, you know, bandages, disinfectant, stuff like that, in case there was any trouble. And what he reported, so he was, what he reported was he was trying to get on his motorcycle and there was an explosion. He said someone threw a Molotov cocktail at him. There have been other reports that someone, what, threw a uh, incendiary device, like in a trash can, right? I mean, there's different versions of this. In any event, something blew up, and it hurled this poor kid through a plate glass window uh, through uh, and a tortilleria uh, there on uh, on the boulevard. Here's the amazing thing. Uh, Louis Sahagan, who reported this story about this, uh, just uh, only discovered while reporting it that the tortilleria, the tortilleria was the one owned by his own grandmother. Oh my God! And yeah, and Lewis never knew this, and end up interviewing his own mom about it for for our story. Uh, so just this incredible uh, connection. So this poor kid, uh, Lynn Ward, he was 15. He died uh, several days later after one of his legs was amputated. It was just a just a horrible, horrible death. But one thing I wanted to mention yes. that because so many people do focus on Salazar, and thank you for your recounting of that. But I think they forget what else happened that day, particularly for for, for Lynn Ward. Um, we're now going to turn to. Uh, Carolina Miranda. And Carolina wrote a story that I found incredibly surprising because so many people focus on the politics of the day, um, the death of Salazar, of course, um, the Chicano movement, you know, and all its fervor and agitation. And uh, you need to know that Carolina writes about the arts and culture. And she found this angle about that very thing and the moratorium. So Carolina, I'll let you explain what you... Uh, what you found about the impact of, of the moratorium on, gosh, painting, literature, music, you name it, after you. Oh, hello, sorry about that, you guys. <laughs> there we are. I muted okay. myself so that I didn't, I didn't cause any problems elsewhere. So my apologies for that. We appreciate it. Why don't you, well, so why don't you start over again? So I, you know, I, we just said arts and culture, take it away. Mm -hmm. So I had, you know, I was interested in what an event of this nature, how it played out in the world of art. And it is such a fascinating story because already there was so much happening by the time August 29th, 1970 hit. Um, the farm worker movement had led to this flourishing of art making, be it prints, paintings, flyers, a lot of it uh, incorporating imagery that dates back to the Mexican uh, Revolution, Mexican art, a lot of artists beginning to very sort of conscientiously sort of 
put an arm's length between Western European traditions and sort of looking more to Mexican indigenous traditions. And what the moratorium did is it, it, it kind of turbocharged that movement. So if there had been an interest in these types of, of art forms before, the moratorium just led to the flourishing. There were many artists who attended, many artists who were activists, many artists who had designed flyers uh, for protests and for events of this nature, including the moratorium, artists who had done theater, political theater, and I think what the event did was provide them with a real impetus to tell the Chicano story through art. And so it spurred mural making, it spurred painting, it spurred performance art and conceptual art. Judy Baca, the founder of uh, Spark, uh, basically helped launch what was a mural renaissance during the 1970s, painting more than 400 murals across Los Angeles during that period, um, motivated in part by what had happened that day. Um, other painters seizing the symbols of the movement or the symbol of Salazar himself and, and, and creating images that sort of told the story of Salazar. So on the one hand, art being inspired by the politics of the day, but also art serving as a key transmitter of that story to following generations. Well, I want you, if you could mention one particular work of art. I believe it's called First Supper. Yes, it's called First, First Supper, Supper after, after, the, after a major riot, right? Exactly. So tell us about that and, and the group that created it. The, the group that created, so one of the, the incredible groups that emerged in the wake of the moratorium was OSCO, and they were a, a collective from East LA of artists founded by Harry Gamboa, uh, the painter Gronk, Patsy Valdez, and Willie Heron, uh, Willie Heron III. And um, Harry Gamboa was at the uh, moratorium that day. And in fact, the moratorium had inspired Harry to pick up a camera and always keep a camera with him. He was very interested in politics. And, um, but I think the moratorium convinced him that, you know, you can write all the stories you want, but if you don't have a camera to document what happens, people aren't always necessarily going to believe that story. But what was interesting is he started deploying his camera in really interesting ways. So Osco, this collective, and Osco means, in Spanish means disgust. Uh, it's a very funny and very pointed name to take on. Um, they start doing these wild performances in, in East LA on Whittier Boulevard. They taped themselves to walls and call it an instant mural. They did another thing where they all dressed up like the sort of the stereotypical facets of murals and paraded down uh, Whittier Boulevard, like Patsy Valdez looking like this goth Virgen de Guadalupe. And one of their famous pieces was this piece called uh, First Supper After a Major Riot, which was set up in a median right there on Arizona Avenue, uh, right just north of Whittier Boulevard. And that site was the site of another anti-Vietnam War protest held roughly six months later in January of 1971, where police also opened fire on the crowd and one person uh, ended up dying. And Harry had been yeah. attended, in attendance that day. And that spot where they held that performance was where Harry had been when, when the sheriff's deputies uh, began to crack down on that protest. And it's this very madcap, surrealist, very pointed response to the events of the day, this combination of Mad Hatter tea party, also these calaveras kind of dining, uh, these Catrinas dining in the middle of, of a median, but also, interestingly, a group of men who had, you know, managed to not get sent to Vietnam and die in that war. Yeah, I should mention that uh, uh, Harry Gamboa was one of the people in the video that we saw earlier in the program, right? So people wanted to catch uh, his remarks again. Um, but another one who really made a significant piece of art, and I mean a big piece of art, was uh, Judy Baca. Can you tell yeah. us about her and her, I guess what she called the Great Wall of, of LA or something like that, right? Exactly. Well, Judy's a force of nature, and she had already been working. I think what's important to note is that a lot of these art movements had sort of been in the works at the time the moratorium happened, but what the moratorium did was turbocharge it. So she had already been producing murals all over Los Angeles. And part of what that whole experience inspired her to do was to go to this uh, drainage area in North Hollywood, the Tujunga um, spillway, 
and paint a series of murals that articulated LA's history from uh, prehistory to the 1950s. And, and, that's, and that history is good, bad, and ugly. It is uh, indigenous labor in California missions. It's um, Japanese American internment during World War II. It's addressing uh, the Zoot Suit riots. Like this is a mural that deals with California history, good and bad. And, and that project, um, I believe it was started in 1974 and it was something like a decade in the making. She and dozens of collaborators over the year took over the spillway area and painted the series of murals. And she said that the moratorium was a formative experience in doing projects like that in terms of wanting to have a voice, wanting to share you know, knowledge of Chicano history in ways that were as public as possible. And what could be more public than painting a mural on a wall and telling a story in, in that way. And I think also as a nexus of collaboration between all of these artists, there were students involved, other artists, teachers, like this was a multi-generational project that went on for years and as a result, kept this history alive. Yeah, uh, and it was one of many murals. Uh, I, I think in your piece you referred to, uh, I'm, I'm gonna mispronounce it, is it Judith or does she say it a different way? It's Judith. Uh, Hernandez, yeah. okay. Um, uh, could you tell everyone about, about her and her, her work? Well, Judith is, is uh, she's a, a really important Chicana painter uh, from Los Angeles. She tried to go to the moratorium that day, but didn't make it to um, Laguna Park because sheriff's deputies had already started to, to crack down on the rally. And she was at Otis at the time. And and Otis what School the, of Art up in Pasadena, right? Yeah, no, no, no. This is Otis. It was back then. It was over by Westlake, the Otis School of Otis College of Art. Now the Otis College of Art and uh, School of Art and Design. They keep changing names. And um, and she says what the moratorium did is it really gave her content. That she said when she had thought about being an artist prior to that day, that she had really thought about the sort of Western European traditions of art. You know, the artist in his garret you know, painting impressionist masterpieces. And she feels that that period, the era's activism combined with that day really made her examine her own roots as a Mexican-American artist. And, and her whole thesis that Otis, in the wake of that experience, ended up exploring Mexican-American symbols. She was particularly interested in representations of women. And so her art has overwhelmingly focused on the female figure. Uh, combining indigenous symbols, Mexican symbols into the work. And then in later in the 1970s, she joined the pioneering collective Los Four. She was the only female member of that group with uh, Carlos Almaraz, uh, Frank uh, Romero, Beto de la Rocha, and um, I'm spacing on the last name. <laughs> I apologize for that. It'll come to you. It'll come to you. But it was, it was a really, really important uh, a collective in that era and she was part of that whole uh, movement and really sort of artists mining this Mexican and Mexican-American past and putting it in their work. Well, I mean, just look at the name Los Four. I mean, that's just that, you know, you can't beat that Spanglish there, you know. Um, exactly, and, exactly. But, you know, but the yeah, art that Judith was inspired- is also a really, a really important muralist. She worked with Judy Baca on the Great Wall of Los Angeles. She had some incredible murals around uh, downtown LA. Uh, there are some of her surviving murals in Ramona Gardens. So her work is still out there and it's still very public. Yeah. Uh, but the, the art that was inspired by that day well, wasn't just murals. So we, we, we associate that a lot, I think, with many Mexican-American artists, uh, but uh, uh, also theater as well. And, um, and if you could talk a little bit about that, there was a play and I think, was it actually staged at the Silver Dollar? Or am I remembering that incorrectly? I'm trying to recall. Well, there were, there. this was in the 90s. This was, uh, um, in 1990, there was a wave of, I think, upon the 20th anniversary of the moratorium, this, there was this wave of artists reconsidering that history and reconsidering that legacy. And there were two plays. There was one called August 29th. And that was staged at the LA Theater Center. That's an image from that play. And that play tells the story about uh, a Chicana uh, scholar who is writing a book about Ruben Salazar. And the play imagines all of these dialogues between them. That's the character playing Ruben Salazar on the right of the image. And it's, it's a character sort of 
trying to, is thinking back on her activist youth and how to reconcile that with now she's a professor, she's successful, uh, she's entered uh, the middle class and, and engaging those themes. There was another play put on by a group called Teatro Urbano and they staged a play in 1990 and they've done it in years since at the site of the old Silver Dollar Cafe. So after it was the Silver Dollar, for a while in the night, apparently it was a bridal shop, then it was empty. So then it was used to stage this play that reimagined uh, Ruben Salazar's final moments. And um, actually this Saturday, some members of that group are going to get together and stage the final scene of the play in front of the site of the oh. old Silver Dollar on Whittier Ball Boulevard. Um, for can Whittier. you tell people if you go to that place, if you go to that address there on Whittier Boulevard, you want to tell them what they can see? Uh, it's it's yeah. uh, it's it's a bit uh, it's a bit depressing actually. Uh, <laughs> well, been, you know, it's like Whittier Boulevard has definitely changed a lot since the 1970s. You know, what used to be a very sort of dynamic mom and pop trip has a uh, strip has changed and. You no, know, now there's like Subway and chain stores and part of it was mowed down to make uh, a large um, strip mall that has a target. But the storefronts where the silver dollar were has survived and it's now actually the Sounds of Music record store um, where you can go and buy some vinyl and some oldies. Uh, so it maintains that memory alive and a Apparently, and this is what Steve Saldivar t tells me, I don't, uh, I haven't been able to verify it. They have inside what is apparently the original out exterior sign for the old Silver Dollar Bar and Cafe. Oh, wow. Uh, up front, by the way, there's just a plaque and it just has his name, Ruben Salazar, and his date of birth and date of death. And that's all it says. It doesn't that's explain anything about him. Although over at Ruben Salazar Park, there is a big plaque that tells the whole story of what happened uh, both to him and the day of the, uh, uh, the moratorium. Uh, there's one last piece of art we want you to mention here, and then we're gonna bring everybody together. Um, uh, Salazar is in the National Portrait Gallery uh, in Washington, all right? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and how that came he about? He is, he, he, he absolutely is. Uh, in the months after the moratorium, this Bay Area artist by the name of Rupert Garcia painted a painting of Salazar. It's a series of monochromatic squares with different close-ups on Salazar's face in different colors. And uh, that he is a, a really well-known Bay Area artist, um, incredible, very important uh, print artist, um, very engaged with Chicano themes and Chicano history. And that painting is now in the National Portrait Gallery. It's not the only painting about that day that's in Washington, D.C. What's also in Washington, D.C. is a painter, is a painting, excuse me, by Frank Romero of Los Four that shows uh, sheriff's deputies shooting at the Silver Dollar uh, Bar and Cafe. Um, so that legacy uh, is still out there on, on museum walls in our nation's capital. Wow, wow. Well, I wanna bring everyone together now, if we can. And um, uh, now I know you're a journalist, so feel free to interrupt, argue, whatever. It's, it's in your blood. Um, but let me add, throw, throw a question to all of you uh, once here. Um, I guess, what, do you see any parallels to today? You know, I mean, we were exploring 50 years ago and talking to people about a variety of issues. Do you see any parallels between what was happening then with, with now? I'm just curious how that struck you. Well, I'll just go ahead and say I think that there's definitely ties. You know, I think the differences that stand out would be that the methods and the language and the lingo and kind of the um, peripheral concerns um, and sub and sub political concerns are different. But the main thrust of like wanting to have justice and equal rights and protection under the law and be protected by the police and not attacked by the police. I mean, we're seeing that this year, literally tonight, literally in Wisconsin. And I think that um, Latinos and the Latino American experience is very much a part of that, that story. So yeah, I think there's definitely a, a conduit to some of the issues back then uh, um, to today, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and Carolina, I think we've even written about already about artists um, being inspired by the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement, I should say. Um, do you, is, are there parallels in the artistic world? 
Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, I think what is happening now is so akin to those days in that, you know, already these, some of these social movements have been going on for years. You know, Black Lives Matter uh, dates back to, I believe, uh, the Trayvon Martin killing. Artists for several years since have been making art inspired by uh, activist causes, social justice causes, um, a whole range of art making that is geared not just at like creating paintings or creating works, but at doing social work that engage community. And that kind of work is very much in keeping with the type of art that was being made at the time. So not just the political graphics, not just the flyers, not just the paintings about these important things, but the ways in which they were made, these very sort of collective communal activities in which you engage community and, um, and together you craft a work. And, and the nature of the works is different today, but I feel like the sentiment that fuels it, as Daniel was saying, is much the same. Um, I did want to add one thing. I remember the last, sure. the name of the last member of Los Born. It was Gilbert Ma Maguluhan, and I'm very embarrassed oh. for not remembering it. So, you know, like, I'm sure he, I'm sure he forgives us now. Sorry, Magu, but. <laughs> and what about now? Question for all of you folks: uh, What what do you think is the most important? What's the what's the most important enduring legacy of of the Chicano Moratorium? Uh, Robert, why don't we start with you on that one? Well, it was clearly a pivotal moment in the uh, political, social, and economical development of the Mexican-American community, not only in Los Angeles, but the Southwest. But as a journalist, I'm going to take a journalistic view on this. I'm biased. CCNMA led, excuse me, the moratorium led to the creation of the California Chicano News Media Association in 1972. This was the first regional organization ever established to advocate for journalists of color uh, Latino journalists and other journalists of color. Uh, this spawned and led to the creation of national organizations, uh, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, the Asian American Journalists Association, the National Association of Black Journalists, uh, Native American Journalists Association. These associations have had important impacts on the media. They have advocated, pushed for, and been successful in diversifying newsrooms across the nation. And why is this important? Because if a newsroom doesn't mirror the communities it covers, it doesn't understand them. It doesn't report on issues accurately, and it doesn't provide a voice for these communities uh, that uh, need a voice. And these are the very things that Ruben Salazar represented and did as a journalist and uh, ultimately paid the highest sacrifice for. So in my perspective, I think this is a very important outgrowth of the Chicano moratorium, and one that a lot of people don't really talk about. They talk about the obvious and necessary um, political and social uh, dynamics, which are absolutely true. But uh, for me, it has to be uh, the birth of CCNMA uh, right here in Los Angeles. Uh, and it was founded by a handful of Latino journalists, including staff members at the Los Angeles Times. And so uh, that's an important thing. And I was one of the many college kids who got a scholarship from the California Chicano News Media Association and uh, and through their job fair, uh, basically got hooked up with the person who changed my life. So, uh, yeah, they had a lot of impact on a lot of Latino journalists uh, all over. Uh, so on this question of the enduring legacy, um, uh, Daniel, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think what uh, Robert just said is very uh, compelling because like you, I was also a scholarship recipient for the, for CCNMA. Um, Ruben Salazar's legacy is one that I think many journalists aspire without even sometimes realizing it. You know, a lot of us kind of run into the career uh, with a lot of bravado and say, we're gonna change the world and I'm gonna show you what it's really like. And there have been journalists kind of doing just that for their particular time and place for many years, going back decades and going back to Ruben Salazar's um, uh, career and his death. But I think also that there was a greater kind of awakening in a sense that we could, as a community, um, make a stand, self-determine uh, our position about something and come together. And I think that there have been echoes of that ever since, organizing against Proposition 187 in the 90s, against Prop 209, uh, against um, uh, Pete Wilson and the kind of anti-immigrant uh, 
race baiting and hate mongering that has occurred in our politics. I mean, it's still going on today. We're still out there hitting the streets as a community. And the community has also been enriched and enlivened and complicated um, in the best way possible by um, different subsets and different communities of, of, of people from Central America and from South America and the Caribbean. So I think all of that, um, we can owe that, that kind of movement to the moratorium and to the activities that were occurring around it from the blowouts Excellent. to, to every. So Carolina, I'll throw it at you as well. Um, uh, although I think some of that lasting, I think you already answered the question in some respects with the art that we're still seeing. But what do you think about the, the, the legacy, the enduring impacts? I mean, I think part of it is, it's so fascinating at how the story that has been slightly semi buried by history has been kept alive by art in so many ways that you know people who were influenced by Osco by studying Osco learned about some of the social causes that inspired Osco's work. But I think I want to end with one of the more curious stories that emerged in all of this, which was one of the lasting organizations that emerged in the wake of the moratorium was Self-Help Graphics in Boyle Heights. And one of the, the, the community events that Self-Help Graphics launched, I believe the first one was in 1973, 1974, was a Dia de los Muertos celebration. And unlike Mexico, in which Dia de los Muertos tends to be a very sort of familial and personal celebration, you go to the cemetery, you celebrate at home, the uh, Self-help graphics really turned this into a procession, a parade, this kind of public seizing of space, a reflection of Mexican identity on the streets of Los Angeles. In a way, it was its own kind of cultural protest. And I think a lot of, you know, Dia de los Muertos has now become this very commercialized event. You know, my local Mercadito has like Budweiser cardboard cutouts for Dia de los Muertos now. But some of that was born in that moment, that need to make Mexican-American culture visible in the United States. Yeah, and then for those, uh, she is speaking about the Day of the Dead, and if anyone saw the movie Coco, you know what we're talking about. Uh, and yes, I cried at the end. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> didn't we all? Um, so we're gonna turn to some questions that we've, that we've received, and one I got earlier today from a gentleman named Mario, um, who is uh, retired, uh, I believe he's retired um, uh, for a parole officer, and he had an interesting question. He asked, you know, what was what was the um, how many Latinos were in the sheriff's department back then? What percentage of the force in the sheriff's department was Latino? And to my surprise, we actually have an answer. Um, uh, uh, Aileen uh, Tekshamijian, uh, who covers the uh, uh, sheriffs for us uh, at the Times, got this answer for me. Uh, turns out, in 1970. Um, the sheriff's department, uh, this is for sworn office, sworn personnel, was 10% uh, Latino. Today, 52.3%. I was stunned to hear that, that stat. So the, um, yeah, from 10% um, to 52.3. Uh, and it shows you quite the change. And I'm, and I'm gonna use that as an excuse to just share a few other stats. Um, LA Unified School District back then was about just under 22% uh, Hispanic or Latino, uh, now 74%. The state um, was about 12% statewide. Those are estimates because at that point, the census still did, did not actually have a what they call Hispanic category. But uh, estimates are that 50 years ago was 12% Latino in the state of California. Now it's 39%. Uh, and then we've seen these other changes, uh, you know, compared from there till now, even the archbishop for the, uh, the diocese is, is uh, Latino now. Uh, Jose Gomez, uh, the sheriff, uh, uh, Villanueva. And, uh, and of course, back in 1970, the thought of a Latino sheriff, the thought of a, a, a Mexican-American being mayor, that was just beyond the pale. I mean, it was just something people could not consider you know, back in 1970. Um, and so it's been quite the change. And, and, I, and actually, that leads me to a question related to art. Another one for you, uh, Carolina, is I think back then, just the way when you see these these stats that um, the Latino population, although at that time was really pr primarily Mexican American, the uh, you know the immigration from Central America hadn't really taken hold yet in Southern California, but at that point Lat Latinos were really just sort of a thing off to the side. They weren't really part of the full fabric, and but that changed as we can see here with these statistics. And I and and I'm wondering, did that has that happened in the artistic world? That they're not just that their own little corner. 
Yeah, it began to happen in the 1970s in a limited way. Uh, Los Four had actually were the first Chicano group to have an exhibition at LACMA at the LA County mm -hmm. Museum of Art in uh, 1974. That was a groundbreaking uh, exhibition. Um, in 1975, there was another exhibition called Chicanismo en el, Ar en el Arte. That was a community show and it was juried like people could submit things, but nonetheless hosted uh, by the LA County Museum of Art. I would say that museums being the kind of being being kind of academic institutions uh, change tends to come slowly. It's kind of like turning an oil tanker. Um, and it was not really until the 90s that you really began to see uh, exhibitions that really began to deal with Chicano identity in a really serious way. Like there was a, a show called Chicano Art Resistance and Affirmation. Uh, that was shown at UCLA at the White Art Gallery in 1990 that was very groundbreaking. And that was actually a place where a lot of artists learned about the Chicano Moratorium for the first time. Really? Wow. Okay. Uh, we have another question, and it it's, uh, was submitted from a gentleman named Alberto. And let me see if I can read this here for you. I think it just came in. Yeah. With any lessons learned for today's reporting and protesting activities? And I guess you could re interpret that a few different ways. Um, you know, lessons uh, that you learned about um, well, what do you think, folks? I'll just turn it to you. I think um, lessons that, learned from you know from this. Ever since 1970, I was just going to say, Steve, that I think you know law enforcement has you know says that it's much more sophisticated in how it responds to large gatherings in public. The sheriff's department told me as I was reporting out this story that they um, you know don't fire tear gas anymore. Um, but we have saw just even recently that, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? Um, a KPCC reporter, Adolfo Guzman Lopez, was hit by some kind of a, uh, 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 a um, gummy bullet um, in his throat, and he's a radio reporter. And he was, um, he still, he writes, and he wrote later, and he told me in the story that I did prior to the moratorium package, that he felt that he was directly targeted. And so Long Beach Police Department is still investigating. That happened during the George Floyd protest. So it's kind of this cyclical thing where some of these incidents are, are still happening. And I think that it's a good opportunity for us as a society here in LA, as a civil society here, to really reinforce the idea that, you know, free speech is sort of one of the pillars of our democracy and the free press is as well. And, you know, the death of Ruben Salazar still remains a very painful dark mark on the history of American uh, press freedoms and press rights. And so I think- Well, I, I've seen, uh, you know, since our, our our project came out, I saw, you know, people tweeting uh, uh, tweeting about Ruben Salazar and thinking of the parallels uh, just for our own colleagues at the Times. Uh, uh, our Houston bureau chief, Molly Hennessy Fisk, she was uh, hit by rubber bullets and had these horrible bruises. Uh, that was up in uh, Minnesota, she was reporting along with Carolyn Cole, who um, also was a, a badly injured with uh, pepper spray in her eyes. And then another reporter uh, up in Portland, Melissa Etahad, also was struck by rubber bullets. So uh, the, the parallels are very, very scary. Um, but what about uh, you, Robert? You see, you know, I mean, lessons learned from, uh, I guess, from the reporting that you did on this. You know, I mean, I, I, I just wonder what you've, you know, found personally about all this. Well, it's just a different time, Steve. Um, Back in that day, uh, there was no real-time uh, video footage. Uh, there was no civilian oversight over the Los Angeles Police Department. In many ways, it was really the Wild West in terms of policing. Um, you know, there were a lot of abuses, and uh, there were people weren't held accountable. I mean, look at what happened with Ruben Salazar's death. Those sheriff's deputies were never held accountable, including the deputy who fired that deadly projectile. So it was a different era. It was also an era of uh, the COINTELPRO operation by the FBI that was um, working to actively neutralize and undermine what they perceived as radical black, Latino, Puerto Rican, Native American uh, groups uh, across the United States. And uh, now uh, it's a different era. I mean, imagine, uh, as I reported in my uh, story on Sunday, uh, the George Floyd incident without, uh, you know, cell phone footage. I mean, that um, footage uh, has uh, changed the conversation. It's um, really refocused nationwide attention on these long-standing issues of police abuse, uh, of, um, you know, harassment of blacks uh, in the uh, 
neighborhoods where they live and, uh, you know, Latinos and uh, police abuses. And so um, really it's um, in many ways uh, apples and oranges, uh, but um, there are parallels, as you say, but um, it's an entirely different ballgame now with the technology that we have and um, the oversight and just the representation. I mean, there was no Latino member of the Los Angeles City Council uh, in 1970. In fact, the last one was Ed Roybal, who left in the early 60s, and there wasn't a uh, Latino to the 1980s. Now look at the council. There was uh, maybe two or three right now. Yep. Yeah, and uh, in the in Sacramento, it was the same thing. Uh, it was what, one or two maybe in the legislature. Now look at and so, um, you know, all that makes a difference. I mean, you've got voices uh, uh, in elected officials, you know, who can um, hopefully advocate for these communities. And so, um, and you've got more uh, Latinos in the media. Uh, when Salazar was at the LA Times, there was probably maybe three or four others that I know of who were there, Mexican-American reporters. It was, uh, I'm aware of two black reporters who were there uh, when he died. There may have been a few more, but not many. So um, it, it's a different situation in many ways. And well, you know, folks, I uh, just want to say uh, th uh, thank you for joining uh, us tonight. Um, you know, this has been uh, quite uh, quite wonderful. And um, so I just want to also thank all the, the readers out there who have been uh, tuning in um, and for reading our stories in print on online. Um, also have to give a big thank you to uh, remarks we've been getting from teachers. Um, and uh, people have been asking us, Carolina, you, you've, uh, have you gotten this too? People asking how can they share with their students? Yeah. Right, and uh, and I know she tweeted out uh, information for this. Uh, there's a link that goes to the LA Times that uh, provides information on how you can uh, find ways to make a, a material available for your students. Uh, and I'll tell you this: if you can't find it uh, on our website, email me, okay, or or send me a message through Twitter. I'll, I'll send it to you, okay, and uh, and we can do that. Um, so you know, of course, tonight we have just barely touched on the, the surface of all this. We could go on for hours, but we won't. And, uh, and I just, again, I wanna thank uh, you, know, you guys for, for joining us and for your work on this, uh, this project. There's still more to come, by the way. Uh, in fact, uh, there will be live commemorative events this Saturday, which is the actual anniversary date, and we will be covering that. And then today, by the way, uh, both online and in the paper, we had yet another story with a real surprise. It was about uh, Jaime Harin, who most people know as Mr. Uh, the Spanish language voice of the Dodgers. Well, uh, uh, Jaime has actually really considered himself a good old street news reporter, and he covered the moratorium and won a Golden Mike Award for it. And so we have a story in today's paper by Kevin Baxter all about uh, Jaime covering the moratorium, uh, the guy who covers, as they say, Los Doyers. Uh, so we thought that was pretty fun. And so you'll see more things uh, popping up. And um, so uh, anyway, so I also want to thank the, all our colleagues at the LA Times who helped out on this, it was a large group of people and uh, lots of Zoom meetings, folks. A lot, there they are. Yeah, uh, lots of people that went through this and, um, and I won't read them all. But, uh, but one of the things actually I will quickly say, I was getting comments from people saying, congratulations on this all Latino project. Um, I think generally by people named like Padilla, you know, but it wasn't. Uh, true, the, a lot of the Latino staffers, the LA Times participated in this effort, but this was really very much a multicultural, multi-generational effort by our staffers at the Times. And that's, I think, one of the reasons it came out so well and why it was also a hell of a lot of fun. So thank you to all our colleagues. And, um, and also I want to point you to, um, just point out that, you know, the Times has made a commitment to telling this important story about LA and explain why it resonates to this, to this day. And we invite you to go to latimes.com and look at this coverage. We mentioned some of this stuff here, the, uh, the story about the, the loss of innocence. You can read Daniel's account about the uh, Consuelo and the red shoes. Um, you'll be able to read about the, that, there it is there. Um, you'll be able to read about what happened that day, uh, Carolina's story. And there it is, uh, some of the art. Also, one thing we didn't mention, but it's in this package, you'll be able to get to it, is we reproduce columns written by Ruben Salazar in the last year of his life. And, uh, and there's also the one about the Chicanas that I mentioned and the, the Adelitas. But anyway, if you want to actually see the impact or see the work of Ruben Salazar, you'll be able to read it. Chasing Salazar is Robert's story, by the way. 
And so you'll be able to see from Gustavo Ariano an appraisal of Salazar's work and then read the columns themselves. Uh, that story right there, by the way, Day of Rage is the one that explains what happened to that poor kid at the Tortilleria. And so we encourage you to go to latimes.com. Oh, and the other thing you'll see soon is we put a call out to our readers asking them to share memories of that day. And they're coming in, including guys, I don't, I don't think I told you this, uh, this one woman remembering uh, go, her mom rushed her into the women's bathroom there at Laguna Park to hide. They go in there and the, play, and the room is full of women with children trying to protect them from the chaos outside. So she goes on to describe in this note to the Times how the sheriff deputies then cleared the bathroom. They made them all leave and get out into the park into the chaos. And this woman provides this firsthand account of that. So we're uh, monitoring our, uh, our website for these, uh, these memories that are coming in and those will be published in some form in coming days. So we um, look forward to that. Um, and lastly, I just wanna say thank you to one particular young man, a guy named Andres. Who sent us? Who sent a note out that he he thanked us for uh, for this series, and he he closed he closed this little just a little tweet, but um, he said he was learning about about black and brown history that he had never been taught, and he said, "quote It's like learning of ancestors I didn't know I had." Andres, we have no better compliment. Thank you for uh, for that <laughs> comment, and thank you for writing. Thank you, Daniel, Robert, Carolina. And for everyone uh, watching tonight, we really appreciate Read the LA Times and um, keep in touch. And you can find all of us, by the way, on Twitter and email. Let's keep the conversation going. Thank you very much and have a good night, everybody. And thank good you night. to our editors who made this all possible. Yes, of course. Thank you for that. Thank you, Steve. Bye, everyone. Great to see you. Thank you, readers. Take care. Okay. Good Bye. night, everybody. <laughs>